you. Can you hear us? Hello? Yes. yes. Professor Chomsky, welcome to Activism Munich. Thank you. Um, so let's get straight to the interview. Um, in your book in 1998, uh, which you wrote, called Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media, you talked about five institutional filters that control and alter, alter the flow of information that serve certain interests in our society. Could you talk about these institutional filters and whether they have strengthened or weakened uh, in our current uh, period? Well, uh, first of all, there was a later edition of that book in which uh, my co-author Edward Herman and I I wrote a new introduction and we pointed out that one of the five filters was too narrow, the fifth one. Uh, with the back writing in the 1980s that we called the fifth filter anti-communism. But it should have been much more general. There's always some invented enemy uh, which is about to destroy us, uh, which we have to defend ourselves against. and. Uh, commentary and analysis and news selection is shaped to support uh, the state uh, uh, propaganda and action against this real or imagined enemy. And for a long time it was the Soviet Union. And it's quite interesting to see what happened. You learn a lot about propaganda and scholarship by looking at what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed. That's the best way to learn about the Cold War. What happened? In 1990, no more Soviet Union. Now what happens? Well, first of all, what happened to NATO? Uh, NATO was established to protect Western Europe against the Russian hordes, theoretically. No more Russian hordes. What happened to NATO? Did it collapse? Did it, was it dissolved? No, it expanded. It expanded to the east. Uh, now right to the Russian borders. Now it's, uh, there's a threat, even a threat of global war because of Ukraine. And meanwhile, the mission of NATO was formally changed uh, to protect uh, the international energy system, sea lanes and pipelines. So it's a global system and also a global intervention force run by the United States, which tells you what it always was and tells you something about anti-communism as a propaganda device. Next thing that happened, a couple of weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the United States invaded Panama, killed hundreds, maybe thousands of people, bombing the slums, uh, all in order to uh, kidnap some, uh, someone who the U.S. didn't like and who was finally tried for crimes, most of which he committed on the CIA payroll. Well, that's kind of normal. One difference is they couldn't appeal to the Russian threat because there's no Russian threat. So it was Hispanic narco traffickers who were about to destroy us. Okay, that lasted for a while, didn't work very well. Then you have to invent new pretexts. The Middle East is a very interesting case. Now, the Bush, this is Bush number one. The Bush administration immediately had to issue a new uh, national security strategy after the fall of the Russians. But what it said is pretty much everything will go on as before, but with new pretexts. Uh, with the Middle East, it said, we must maintain the intervention forces aimed at the Middle East. And then came a very interesting phrase, where the serious threats to our interests could not have been laid at the Kremlin's door. In other words, We've been lying to you for 50 years. It's not the Russians. It's what they call radical nationalism, independent nationalism. But we still need the intervention forces to crush that. And so it continues. Everything goes on, but with new pretexts. Well, that tells us that our fifth filter was misstated. It's not anti-communism. It's whatever pretext is invented to justify continuing uh, processes of global intervention, of aspersion, of force, of uh, uh, international treaties to uh, uh, support the interests of domestic capital and so on. That's the fifth filter. Uh, now, going back to your question, all of them are operative today. Uh, 
I want to talk to you about, since we touched upon the Middle East, uh, uh, the current uh, um, situation there, and related to your book, um, there's a radical fighting force in the Middle East called ISIS, and they're, they're carrying out beheadings um, of journalists. In your book, uh, Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media, you talk about unworthy and worthy victims. Uh, can you briefly explain what this means, and whether you think that this applies uh, to the current uh, atrocities happening there? Well, ISIS, of course, are uh, unworthy victims, and they're, they are a pretty horrible force, uh, but the U.S. is opposed to them uh, in a funny way. Take a look at U.S. policy uh, towards ISIS. There are several forces in the region that are really combating ISIS. Uh, the main state is Iran. Iran is combating ISIS. Is the U.S. supporting Iran against ISIS? No, Iran is an enemy. We have to undermine it. Uh, on the ground, the main force uh, opposing ISIS, say, in, uh, around Kaban in Syria, is uh, the PKK, the uh, Turkish-based uh, guerrilla group that's uh, on the U.S. terrorist list. The U.S. is not supporting them. Uh, of course, it's not supporting the Assad regime, which uh, also is opposed to ISIS. Now, what's the policy of opposing ISIS? It's uh, uh, one of the main commentators on the region, the most, inf the one who's been the most informed and accurate, Patrick Coburn, that calls it an Alice in Wonderland policy. It's a policy that's meaningless. It's pieced together. It's somehow the Obama administration is trying to oppose ISIS while also opposing the forces that are opposed to ISIS. Uh, that's, uh, so who are the worthy and unworthy victims? Well, you try to pick them out. It's whoever the U.S. is opposing at the moment. Uh, let's get to some economic issues. Uh, we know that a free trade agreement is being uh, negotiated between the European Union and the United States behind closed doors, uh, known as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Uh, our Chancellor Angela Merkel is, and uh, with, along with President Obama, is touting how this will boost jobs, economic growth, development, and trade. You completely rebuff the term free trade agreement and assert that they're not free, that they do not promote global trade, and they're anything but agreement. Could you elaborate on this? I'm sorry, I didn't agree. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, I was talking about the uh, free trade agreement that is being signed. Free trade agreement, yes. Um, and you completely... Transatlantic agreement? Yeah, exactly. Could you elaborate on this uh, transatlantic agreement that's being signed between the yes. United States and uh, the European Union? Well, uh, first of all, we have to uh, remember the five filters. It's not a free trade agreement. It has virtually nothing to do with free trade. Virtually nothing. Tariffs do exist, but they're very low. And change in the tariff agreements means essentially nothing. It's a protectionist agreement. It's anti-free trade. Now take a look at its, first of all, it's in secret. Remember, it's crucially in secret. The population's not supposed to know about it. Now, it's not totally in secret. The corporate lawyers and lobbyists who are writing the agreement, it's not secret from them. So it's not secret to the corporate world. It's not secret to the state authority. It's just secret from the population. Already tells you something. Pieces have been leaked, some of it through WikiLeaks. One piece that was leaked was the uh, intellectual property rights section, which is one of the core elements of the agreement. Now, what are intellectual property rights? Now, that's a uh, complicated word that means uh, highly protectionist uh, measures to ensure the profits, the exorbitant profits of uh, American and international pharmaceutical corporations and media corporations. That's anti-free trade. That's protection, extreme protectionism in the interests of uh, very wealthy and powerful parts of the corporate system. Uh, other parts are called which we don't have the details of, remember, because it's secret, but looking at other agreements, we can guess, uh, are a variety of investor rights uh, uh, provisions to ensure the rights of investors against the population. Uh, take, say, NAFTA, 
which we do know because it's there, we can see. It was also negotiated in secret, but now it's public. A large part of it is, the, is guarantees of the rights of U.S. investors to what's called national treatment in Mexico. So if General Motors invests in Mexico, has to be treated like a Mexican company. Uh, if a Mexican human being comes to New York, he doesn't have the rights of an American citizen. Quite the contrary, he can end up in prison for the rest of his life. But American corporations have to have the rights of Mexican businesses. Uh, U.S. agribusiness, highly subsidized agribusiness, totally against free trade, has to have the right to flood the Mexican market with the produce uh, that the Mex Mexican campesinos can't compete with, of course. Uh, so that sets up what's called a refugee uh, immigration crisis when they're driven off the land and they flee. That's NAFTA. But one of the provisions allows a corporation, not a person, not you or me, but it allows a corporation to sue a state if the state is taking measures which might potentially interfere with profits. So if Mexico, say, decides to uh, set up a, an environmentally protected region where some American corporation wants to invest, they can sue Mexico for taking their profits, their future profits on the area that Mexico is trying to protect. That's, uh, again, human beings can't do that corporations can. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of provisions that you see in the trade agreements. They're not free trade agreements. They're not about free trade. In fact, much to, the, to a large extent, they're not about trade at all. And they're certainly not agreements, at least if people are part of their countries. People are mostly opposed to them, which is why they're in secret. So every word in the phrase free trade agreement is just false. In, uh, in Germany, there's a lot of grassroots organization taking place around the concept of a basic income guarantee, whereby citizens receive an unconditional sum of money to cover the basic costs such as rent, food, and electricity, etc. Could you uh, provide your assessment on this concept of basic income guarantee? Basic income guarantee? In Germany. In Germany and elsewhere. Actually, that's an interesting concept. It comes from the right wing, originally. Uh, Milton Friedman proposed it, for example. From his point of view, it was part of an effort to undermine welfare state measures. But it doesn't have to have a reactionary uh, uh, component. It can be interpreted as something progressive. Uh, people ought to, their people have rights. In fact, if you read the Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights, 1948, Take a look at Article 25. It says people have rights to uh, f adequate food, nutrition, health, uh, employment, security, and so on. Those are minimal rights. Any society ought to guarantee that. Well, you know, one way to guarantee it would be through a socially uh, acceptable form of uh, a, a basic income. Uh, in fact, to an extent, that's what welfare, so-called welfare states, try to provide in a certain way. So sure, that's uh, uh, something that could be proposed. I mean, I don't think it goes far enough, but as a short-term way of alleviating major problems, that's fine. Uh, and there are elements in various societies that do provide things like that. To my last question, could you list some dangers that humanity is facing or is going to face in the 21st century and what mechanisms are available to the public in order to avoid this catastrophe? Piece? So what, what dangers are we going to face in the 21st century? And there, there are two overwhelming dangers, huge shadows looming over everything. The first of them is environmental catastrophe which is coming. We can debate how long it'll be, but it's coming, and it could be very severe. Now, there are things that can be done about it, but 
there, in some places, some things are being done, like say Denmark is moving towards some kind of sustainable energy. Uh, Germany has plans to move towards a larger degree of sustainable energy. But for the most part, we're just racing towards the uh, cliff that we're going to fall over. It's almost certain that most of the fossil fuels must be left in the ground uh, if we hope to have a decent survival. On the contrary, the energy corporations are trying to exploit uh, every last uh, opportunity to get a drop of uh, oil out of the ground or gas, uh, and uh, they're, not, they're not being stopped. That's uh, part of the logic of uh, a capitalist market is that you maximize short-term profit and you don't pay attention to what the consequences are for others or for the future. So that's a huge problem. And things can be done about it, but they're not being done except in limited ways. And uh, that will be real catastrophe for our, not very far off for future generations. The other major, major shadow is nuclear war. That should not be underestimated. We've come very close to nuclear war repeatedly. The nuclear war is essentially a terminal disaster. It's uh, something that survived, but not much. And we've come close. There are serious dangers right now. We know how to, in theory, we know how to eliminate them, but we're not doing it. Uh, in fact, the nuclear programs are being expanded. Uh, the U.S. program is being expanded by about a trillion dollars over the coming decades. Uh, but uh, there's serious crises in Ukraine and the Middle East, elsewhere, that could break into nuclear war. Now, these are major problems. In the background is another problem. It's not a problem of survival, but it's a problem of minimal decency. And that is the neoliberal assault against the global population that's been going on now for a generation. It's having different effects in different places almost always deleterious. Now, a few places have be, been able to begin to extricate themselves from it. Uh, one of the most important is South America. Uh, for the first time in 500 years, South America has, become, has begun to extricate itself from Western imperial control last century. That means U.S. control. And to unify, to... Uh, uh, to develop uh, internal organizations that exclude Western domination, to face some of its tremendous internal problems. Uh, the U.S. has been almost driven out of most of the hemisphere, which is a remarkable change in world affairs. Uh, and they, uh, partly they're reacting to the neoliberal assault, which was quite devastating in South America. They actually followed the rules and suffered. Uh, other, in Europe, uh, the austerity programs are extremely destructive, destructive of life, of uh, survival, of democracy. Uh, and there are some attempts in the peripheral countries mainly to try to respond to them. Uh, in the United States, uh, the neoliberal assault has had the effect of virtually undermining uh, democracy. Uh, it barely functions. Take a look at the last election. 24, November 2014, the statistics have just come out on actual voting. Now, they've been studied by some leading political scientists, Walter Dean Burnham and Thomas Ferguson. What they point out is that voting participation in the last election was actually, for the most part, back to the level of the early 19th century. That's a time when voting was restricted to property to white males. Voting participation is back to that level in much of the country. That's a sign that people have simply abandoned any hope in the democratic system with some reason, because stud careful studies show what we basically all know, that the opinions and attitudes of the large majority of the population have no effect whatsoever on policy. The policy is determined by an extremely narrow sector of concentrated wealth. That's plutocracy. It's not democracy. Take a look at the economic situation. Since the neoliberal assault began, mainly under Reagan, a little before, but 
escalating under Reagan, uh, for most of the population, it's been a period of stagnation or decline. The real wages for male workers are back to the level of the 1960s. Now, there's been productivity growth and wealth increase, but it's going to a tiny percentage of the population, actually a fraction of 1% dominate. And for most of the population, it's stagnation, sometimes decline. Those are serious problems. They can be dealt with. Those are not at the level of the first two I mentioned, but they're serious. And they're affecting people's lives, seriously. And there are plenty of other problems to deal with. It takes a, uh, a terrorism, serious problem. The most, there is a global terrorism campaign far beyond any other. It's Obama's drone campaign. That's a terrorist campaign of a scale that has never existed in the past. This campaign is formally, officially, explicitly aimed at people who the government suspects might someday want to harm us. Might someday want to harm us. They have to be killed along with anybody else who's standing around. I mean, if, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda or anyone came out with a campaign like that, we would be beyond scandalized. We'd probably nuke them. Uh, but that's official policy supported by the Western countries. Now, that's a serious problem. Global terrorism is a serious problem. And this is right at the top. And we can go on and think of plenty of others. Noam Chomsky, renowned uh, American linguist, philosopher, cognitive scientist, political commentator, and activist. It was a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>